My name is Ruth Griffith, and thank you for joining Snow Isle Libraries for Paddling the Mekong River with Dave Ellingson of Edmonds, who's known as the Paddle Pilgrim. So first, some housekeeping. Your mics are muted. Please use chat to ask questions. We will use chat on our end to share links to any resources and websites mentioned today. After Dave's presentation, we'll have time for questions, and you're welcome to submit questions in chat at any time and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. If you would like to turn on captions for this event, we will drop the instructions in the chat box. This event is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel with captions in a week or two. Now, let's introduce tonight's speaker and topic. Dave Ellingson is a local Lutheran pastor master gardener, and former distance runner and triathlete who is now known as the Paddle Pilgrim. The Mekong River trip is not Dave's first epic kayak adventure. He has also kayaked the length of the Mississippi River. He's traveled the Erie Canal and Hudson, Hudson River to the Statue of Liberty and paddled through the fjords of Norway. We'll drop a link to his books in the chat so you can place a hold. Dave has created videos and written books about each of these epic adventures. This latest trip down the Mekong River, which we will hear all about tonight, will also come out in book form. And let me share a sneak peek of that book cover right now. There it is. Okay. Uh, now about tonight's Oh, it looks like it's giving me the same image as before. I apologize. My share must be malfunctioning somehow. Let's try this again. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Somehow that, that one image is not there. So we'll go ahead and just share our title screen again. Um, we'll work on getting that book image later in, in tonight's program. All right, about tonight's program. In March 2023... Four intrepid paddlers launched their kayaks for a month-long adventure down the Mekong River through Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam to the South China Sea. Author and adventurer Dave Ellingson, known as the Paddle Pilgrim, led the group as they encountered diverse cultures, beheld spectacular scenery, witnessed environmental issues, and experienced physical, emotional, and spiritual challenges. The expedition benefits the Dithpran Foundation, which raises money to support the, educa the educational dreams of Cambodian young people, and the Center of Rehabilitation and Support for Handicapped Children in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, and the Dave Ellingson Scholarship for Environmental Studies. Find out more about Dave Ellingson at paddlepilgrim.com. So, let's start tonight's program with a beautiful video that Dave has created, which will run about 20 minutes. And afterwards, Dave will be happy to discuss the trip and answer any questions. So pop those questions into chat at any time. For now, let's get rolling with the video. Here we go. Hey, hey thanks. The Mekong River flows through lands where people have lived and farmed and prayed for thousands of years. Beginning high in the mountains of Tibet, it flows through China, Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, providing water, fish, transportation, and life itself to millions of people. Tourists from around the world are coming here, and you can see why. I, too, found myself drawn by the beauty and a sense of adventure. I had decided to kayak the mighty Mekong River. I'm Dave Ellingson, the Paddle Pilgrim. This journey would mean paddling 500 miles in 30 days through Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam to the South China Sea. Yes, a very ambitious plan. And my friends back home kept saying, what? But I also found myself drawn here to wrestle with something from my college days in the 60s.
Southeast Asia became the stage for a battle between the superpowers, the Soviet Union and the United States. In the Vietnam War, with devastating consequences as millions of lives were lost and the countryside destroyed. Many of my friends went off to fight. As a student, I was deferred and I protested the war. War demonstrators protest U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War in mass marches, rallies, and demonstrations. These tragic events were headline news. But the Vietnam War shaped my identity in ways both large and small, and led me to wonder what this region is like today, and what its people think of Americans, and maybe some deeper questions. I had to go see for myself, so I set out to paddle through these peaceful and troubled waters. I invited three brave souls to join me, and I found each of us were on a personal quest. Dr. Debbie Castle is a college biology professor whose research in fire ants has led to fame as the ant lady. We were high school classmates back in Iowa. Debbie's brother fought in Vietnam. David Gurky, Gurk, is a retired defense attorney. He was a conscientious objector during the war and served as an army medic at a base in Germany. Reverend Tom Glasso is a Lutheran pastor like myself, and over the years we have shared the struggles and joys of being in the ministry. Tom's quest was very personal as his mother was Vietnamese and his father an American who was there during the war. So the building that I lived in, which is, doesn't exist anymore, was at the end of this uh, walkway, and um, it was for the eight, nine, and 10-year-olds. Tom was abandoned in an orphanage and adopted by an American family. So the team gathered, and we were off. We were fortunate to get our hands on inflatable kayaks that fit into large rolling bags. After 16 hours in the air, we were finally in Laos. We all had a fitful night's sleep, but couldn't wait to get on the water. Everybody is up, ready, happy, healthy. It's a great day. Thanks for doing all the work. That's okay. A rush of adrenaline helped us haul our gear down very steep slopes to the river. Low water and high banks. Tough kayaking was ahead. 13. 14. My happy place, right in this kayak with three of the most spectacular and amazing and funny guys I've ever known. I am just loving this. And away it go. Whoa, we were that. planning to camp along the way or stay with local folks in villages, and so we were fully loaded with gear. Our goal was to paddle 20 to 25 miles a day. But the going was slow as we discovered our inflatable kayaks weren't as fast as our hard shell kayaks back home. And the river was big with little current to help us along. The kid in me started wondering, are we there yet? As we camped on a sandbar island, we enjoyed a beautiful sunset. I went looking for water and met a woman and her son who were harvesting watermelons. Her shy smile felt like a welcome to her land. We were going at a snail's pace, and in my tent that night I began to wonder, had we bitten off more than we could chew? Is how hard it is to paddle an inflated kayak in 100 degree temperature. Sometimes with a slight headwind, sometimes with no current, it wore me out. We felt like joining the water buffalo as they cooled off in the river. The team's mood, however, was very positive. Lots of laughter. We were having a great time despite things not going according to plan. We definitely didn't want to abandon ship. Anything on the river is noteworthy, and when it's four Americans in these inflatable kayaks that are colorful, waving at the kids, um, 
It's amazing, and, and, I, and I love doing that, and it's infectious. Now, I'm reaching out even more to get the joy to them and to me. After another long day of paddling, we were exhausted. But we got a wake-up call in a stretch called the Land of 4,000 Islands. When Dave took the lead through the rapids, I was so relieved. I've done rapids. I thought maybe I would know what to do. But every decision he made wasn't the one I would have made. It was the correct one, nevertheless. And he got us safely through here. Rounding a bend, we were surprised and happy to see a beautiful hotel on the riverbank. A hotel wasn't in our plans, but our aging bodies needed a break. The owner, Pan Arena, became our first river angel, providing hospitality in wonderful rooms and delicious food. Pan would also guide us to the massive Kone Falls, which stretch for eight miles across the river, the widest waterfall in the world. Our pause at the hotel brought a reminder to slow down, which can be hard for Americans who are always in a rush. This was an important epiphany that our quest included enjoying the people, the culture, and human kindness. We needed to stop and smell the roses. It was such a positive experience to have so many challenges. It was always a group discussion, and we worked it out. And so it never felt like, oh, man, I want, I just want to go home. I never had that feeling. It's like every day I got up, and I was just really excited for the next adventure. We faced the fact that we simply could not reach in time our scheduled stops along the river. We decided to pack up our gear feeling a bit deflated like our kayaks. We needed to leave the river for the time being and hitched a ride from below the falls into Cambodia. We weren't able to kayak as much as we had planned and so therefore that time kayaking was replaced with, with a large amount of engagement with the local people that we, you know, that we met. And I think we are better for it. Arriving in Phnom Penh, the capital of Cambodia, we immediately were overwhelmed by urban life. This was beginning to feel like an Anthony Bourdain adventure. We were blessed by our second river angel, an American named Philip Baker, a semi-retired Lutheran pastor, professor. Phil became our host and guide. We prayed in magnificent temples. We toured and absorbed culture in museums. We savored delicious and inexpensive food and wandered through sprawling markets. We visited a silk farm on an island, and our guide at the silk farm had lost a leg to a Vietnam-era landmine. I was surprised that he showed no bitterness, only gratitude for the opportunity to work and support his family. We were literally stopped in our tracks by our visit to the killing fields. After the Vietnam War, a terrible tragedy took place in Cambodia without much notice. A radical communist insurgency, the Khmer Rouge, led by Pol Pot, tortured and killed two million people in their attempt to create a pure society. We visited one of the over 200 killing fields where bodies were buried. Over a quarter of all Cambodians died. It was horrific. I was privileged to meet Chum May. He survived simply because he was needed as a mechanic to keep the trucks of the Khmer Rouge rolling. Over dinner each night, Dr. Phil helped us process our experiences. He described this genocide as having created PTSD for an entire nation. 
And yet, Cambodia is slowly recovering and rebuilding. Dr. Phil serves a group started by Lutherans called Life with Dignity. They focus on sustainable livelihood, clean water, sanitation, and hygiene. Dr. Phil said, we Lutherans came 50 years ago, and we are still here. At the border, some men helped pile our gear onto their motorcycles, and we rode into Vietnam, where we were met by, are you ready for this? Dr. Fu and Mr. Hu. We were now in the vast Mekong Delta with its many channels. The Delta was the scene of many of the battles in the Vietnam War. I remember watching news reports of these dangerous waterways. Almost immediately, we had to fix a leak in Tom's kayak. We finally launched and were very excited to be back on the water, paddling by houses on stilts and people fishing. Blustery headwinds picked up and we began to dodge large barges. Dr. Fu and Mr. Hu had been following us in a trailer boat because they were worried about our safety. They came alongside and invited us to grab a hold. Like chicks pulled to safety by a mother hen, we enjoyed a speedy trip downriver. Our fun was short-lived as the police were also concerned for our safety and ordered us to leave the river. Yes. Safely back on shore, Tom and Debbie had to dance. <laughs> our next river angel was Dr. Win Min Kwong from Kanto University. He and his team of student citizen scientists are researching the effects of climate change on this region. Yeah, Dr. Kwong and his Mekong Environmental Forum took us to visit several of their projects. They're helping people along the Mekong directly affected by climate change. Their projects include floating fish farms. And we paused there for a tickling episode. How can you top this experience? There were islands with shrimp and crab production that we toured by bike. And an ecology farm with narrow bridges we crossed very carefully. Another economic boost is ecotourism with local arts and crafts. This work includes boat trips employing women paddlers and offers tourists delicious loganberries and traditional music. Their projects are also helping revive the floating supermarkets by delivering tourists to new restaurants. We were honored to speak and engage with students in one of Dr. Huang's classes, and happy to meet these young people creating a future for Vietnam that is sustainable and environmentally responsible. Like their neighbors in Laos and Cambodia, we found the people of Vietnam were welcoming friendly, generous, and kind. Our final days were spent in Ho Chi Minh City, formerly Saigon. Etched in my memory of the war is a helicopter saving the lives of people from a roof near the U.S. Embassy. This iconic photo became known as the last helicopter out of Saigon. We visited the orphanage where Tom had lived as a boy before coming to America. A flood of memories welled up in Tom. Several years ago, through a DNA test, Tom discovered his American father was not a soldier, but a journalist covering the war. But his mother's identity remains a mystery. Tom and I met with two UN. She helps Amerasians by hosting a local TV show called As If We Were Ever Apart to help Tom in his search. They interviewed him for their program. I want to find my mom because I have two boys, two little boys, and I want them to know about their grandma. 
But I also want to know, you know, from my own, you know, what my mom was like. Who was she? What, you know, what got her into the position that forced her to give me up? Um, I want to know her story. And in a way, that's my story. Tom failed to find any leads about his mother, but is not giving up. Our final day, we toured the presidential palace. As we sat resting from the heat, children peppered us with questions in excellent English learned from watching American cartoons. We felt their fearless love, a love we experienced throughout our adventure. We then went to the War Remnants Museum. We were repeatedly struck by the pain and destruction of the American War. In the museum, I rubbed shoulders with many older American men. We were each on our own pilgrimage. They had fought, I had protested. We were all a part of a generation seeking healing, hope, and closure. As we left, we saw another sign for the museum. The museum was about the war, but dedicated to peace. Our adventure began with many questions. What was this place like 50 years after the war? What do its people think of Americans? And how will our adventure change us? Tom deepened his connection to his birth nation and his commitment to finding his birth mother. Kirk has found a people and a place which feels like a second home, and he's eager to visit again and to serve. For Debbie, this was the trip of a lifetime, and it will spur her on to make new scientific discoveries that serve all creatures. And for me, the paddle pilgrim, going down the Mekong has inspired me to rededicate my life to work for peace and justice at home and around the world. As we neared the end of the mighty Mekong River, we realized that our journey had been far more than we had planned. We had learned to stop and smell the roses, or even better, to linger with the lotuses. By the way, we made it to the South China Sea, but it was all about the journey. and um, get some questions for Dave. Sorry about that. So Dave, uh, first of all, I'm just curious, uh, when is your book going to come out? It is out. It is out, okay. Yes, and it's called Paddle Pilgrim, um, Mekong uh, River Adventure Through Lao, Cambodia, and Vietnam. A rather long title, but if you go, it's on Amazon. If you go to my website, Paddle-Pilgrim, you got to get that dash in there. It's also available in the store on my website, and I will do autographed copies and send to people if they'd rather go through the store on my website than go to Amazon. But either way, um, the book is out and available and, and doing very well. It's actually uh, been ranked the top travel book to Southeast Asia for the last two weeks since it's come out. Oh, that's excellent. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Let's let's see. Um, here's a question for you. It says, "Have you done extensive kayaking elsewhere on the Asian continent?" I have not. This was the first Asian experience, and one which I'm very grateful for. I had gone to Norway, but that was the the <clears throat> the scene of my ancestors, the Vikings. But I want to get back 
to Asia, uh, particularly in, in Vietnam, there's an area way up in the north called Ha Long Bay, uh, not too far from Hanoi. And so I've made a number of good friends. And so I will definitely return, particularly with my friend, Dave Gurky, Gurk, because he's actually going back to Cambodia during Tet to work in a school for a month. So the connections we made and our commitment to to those countries uh, has grown, plus the money we've raised for the orphanage that Tom grew up in, the uh, the Dith Pran Foundation, and then the scholarship that my students uh, created. So all of that will continue. Uh, people often ask, where's the next adventure gonna be? And I'm not sure, but I have to say, I, I'm hoping to get to another continent and I'm thinking of the Nile River, Oh. And um, what I'm imagine, and immediately when I say that, people say crocodiles, right? <laughs> the, the the crocodiles are way up near the sources of the um, Nile. I'm thinking of paddling from near Luxor, you know, which is the Valley of the Kings and all the archaeological historical area, to at least Cairo and maybe on to um, Alexandria. So. Usually every two years I do an adventure, and that's the one that's kind of been popping up in my brain lately. That sounds fabulous. Uh, do your paddling friends want to go on another uh, epic paddle as well? Well, the, what's interesting is I've got several different paddling friends, and we truly are friends. And you could see, even with the difficulties and the heat and the smoke and the humidity along the Mekong, we had a wonderful time. We we really are our friends and became much closer so i i suspect if i were to do another adventure i could pop them a note and say who wants to go and then i have a couple of other buddies who paddled with me in norway and i've paddled with along the mississippi river that live back in minnesota and wisconsin and um so i've actually got a list of a number of people who who once they've heard about these adventures said let me know when the next adventure is happening and, and maybe maybe I can go with you. So I think that list is about 15 people now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'll be joining that list. I, you know, I'm a 90 degrees is my limit. <laughs> I'm well, gonna... <laughs> usually, usually it is for me too, yeah. <laughs> but when you're on the water, it's a little cooler. Oh, that's good to know. Let's see, somebody's asking, uh, what kind of customs and border issues did you have when you went from one country to another? That was very challenging, and I'll give you the background. It used to be in, in much of the world, but particularly in Southeast Asia, that you could get a visa that would last <clears throat> for a year. And during that year, there was sort of unlimited movement between countries, right? Well, the COVID epidemic or pandemic changed everything and it reduced it down to 30 days. So we had multiple 30 day visas and we we flew into Vietnam, flew to Laos, paddled down, had to cross the border into Cambodia, crossing the border from Cambodia into Vietnam, got to Saigon or Ho Chi Minh City and then flew up to Angkor Wat for a three day at the end. And so we, I won't go into the details, but it was very challenging. I think now that things are getting back to more normal with travel, um, and ours was different in the sense that, let's say, there are a lot of good cruises and travel groups on the Mekong now. If you go with them, they're going to arrange and make sure everything's in good shape. We were, <laughs> as you can see, we were figuring it out as we were going, and um Thankfully, the, the border people did their best to understand who this wacky group of uh, people were going down. And, and we managed. No one got thrown in jail, but we had an attorney in our group so that if we if we had gotten thrown in jail and, and Tom would have prayed for me and I would have prayed for Tom. <laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Um did you have a problem finding safe drinking water and food? Somebody's asking. Um, no, not really. Um, whenever we, uh, if, if, if we were to be in camp, we'd boil water or we'd add tablets or both. But most of the time we were able to get 
we had we had a gallon or two gallon plastic collapsible containers. And so when I said on that island at the start, I went looking for water. I was carrying four gallon containers that were empty that we had used the day before. So we were using a lot of water and um, we would fill those whenever there was an opportunity. If we got to a, a town or a restaurant or something, the people were very gracious and they allowed it. So we didn't we didn't have any water problems uh, on the food end of things. That was one of the highlights of the trip. Southeast Asian cuisine is magnificent. I joked when we got to Phnom Penh in Cambodia that this was an Anthony Bourdain experience. Anthony Bourdain, I don't know if you've seen any of his programs, sadly is no longer with us, but um, I always enjoyed his adventures because he would often go off the, off the beaten track. And he, um, he claimed that the Vietnamese food was one of the two or three best foods in the world. And, and the fun part of his loving Vietnamese food was he, he contacted or maybe Barack Obama knew about this. And so Barack Obama, when they normalized relationships with Vietnam, flew to Ho Chi Minh City. <clears throat> he met up with um, Anthony Bourdain in Anthony's favorite restaurant. And he had what he said was one of the best meals he'd ever had. So we never had uh, any difficulty. Um, often we would eat what's called street food. A ma and a pa or a grandma and a child would, would just be cooking right on the street. And oh my goodness. And we could have a, a plate full of all sorts of things for a couple of bucks. And it was delicious. Wow. And I yeah. bet you had a good appetite too. <laughs> <laughs> we did. We did. Usually I lose weight on these adventures. Uh, I didn't on this one. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, here's another question. Um, I'm curious what the Vietnam War or American War veterans in your life thought of your journey. Well, that's a really good question. And, and as I mentioned to Ruth earlier, tonight's program and showing <clears throat> is literally the first public. It's the premiere. <laughs> of the film I produced. So I'm looking forward to hearing what people have to say. What I tried to do was present a balanced perspective from the point of view of my friend, Debbie's brother fought in Vietnam. And he actually, he has contacted me and thanked me for it and commented on how when he was bush out in the bush, he, he loved the Vietnamese people. But he said they didn't understand really for the most part what was going on. So so he and Tom, of course, was a product of the war. And and so finding his father a couple of years ago and now trying to find his mother, um, this is his birth nation. And I think he felt very good, even though he didn't get any leads on his mom. I think he felt very good um, about his experience. Uh, Gurk um, has actually lived in Vietnam at different times. And so, but each of us came with a different perspective. I was a protester, right? right. Um, you know, and, and Gurk was a, a conscientious objector, but he served as a medic. So each of us came with a different perspective. And so I tried to be balanced. Um, I'm sure there will be somebody who will, who will think I wasn't balanced, but I hope that I was. I'd be curious to see what people who watched um, thought about that. Mm -hmm. We'll see if something comes through in the comments. Um, okay. On a little bit different um, topic, uh, someone asked, do you still have a desire to complete the full paddle of the Mekong? No. Um, I We learned in the process, and, and as I've gotten a little older, <laughs> um, that it's it's about the journey. And even though when I did the Mississippi 10 years ago, I did 2,350 miles, right? And that was pretty much solo. Um, that journey was about doing the Mississippi, right? It was my Huck Finn adventure. And I, come hell or high water or low water, I was gonna, I was gonna complete that journey down the Mississippi. As I've done more paddles, I've, I think I've learned. And when I talked about the epiphany the, the learning that, that we had on this adventure, that whether it's you use the metaphor stopping to smell the roses or stopping to 
to ling linger with the lotus. My book, I have an essay in my book called Lingering with a Lotus. And um, so, no, I don't feel any great need to to paddle more of the Mekong, but I do want to go back because I made some very dear friends. In fact, Dr. Huang is co coming to Seattle. He's speaking at several places in the United States, and I'm working with some professor friends um, at the University of Washington for him to speak uh, to the Southeast Asian program and to the environmental studies program. So I feel like, um, you know, what, wherever we are in our life is a journey. Uh, savor it, enjoy it, whether it's a paddle, whether it's a hike, whether it's a good nap, get the <laughs> most out of it. <laughs> That's just so wonderful, the connections that are made between nations and scientists and, you know, all kinds of wonderful connections. Yep. Um, okay, here's another question. How did you prepare, not physically, but to be ready for the people you'd meet, uh, their culture, history, and customs? Well, in my office here, I've got about 10 books sitting over here on the bookshelf. So I read a lot, obviously. Um, the 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 best book I read on the Mekong was written by Brian Ehlers. Uh, it's called The Demise of the Mighty Mekong. So if somebody wants to really dig in, he he is the uh, works at the Stimson Institute, which is a think tank in Washington, D.C., and he has traveled the full length of the Mekong, and he wrote this magnificent book, which I read by way of preparing. And then as I read it, I thought, you know, I'm going to try and contact him. So I looked at the flyleaf of the book, and here was the organization. So I went to their website, and there was a phone number. And I called the phone number, and I said, is Brian Ehlers there? And they said, well, yeah, I think he's in his office. So the next thing I know, I'm talking to Brian Ehlers. And I said, Brian, I'm going to paddle the Mekong. And he said, oh, that sounds fabulous. So he became kind of a consultant because he spends a lot of his life in Southeast Asia um, and knows more about, for a, an American, he knows more about Southeast Asian than anybody that I know. And actually on my book, Flyleaf, on the back cover, he, he wrote one of the reviews. And um, so, you know, it's, I, I just enjoy people, as you can probably imagine. So whether whether I've done research or I just run into the watermelon lady on, I wish I could have spoken in her language, but I just enjoy people. And, you know, if I, my, my, my philosophy is if you're kind and loving to people, 99% of the time, they're going to be kind and loving back. And they were, and they are. And so the preacher in me, get me going here. <laughs> wonderful here's another question um how long was the total trip how long well it was a little over a month right now the the mekong is several thousand miles so we we jumped in in the lower part of the mekong in the country we often say laos but the people there call it lao and so we jumped in in a, in a city called Paxi in Laos, and we paddled for a ways in Laos and then Cambodia and then Vietnam. And, and so if one were to paddle the whole Mekong, uh, which I don't think anybody has to my knowledge, um, it would be about 2,500 miles. It starts up in the, in, uh, in the Himalayas. And in Brian's book, he talks about these incredible gorges with white water and you know just traveling along the roads is scary right and then it becomes a river and it changes along the way and each country adds flavor to it Myanmar as you're probably all aware has become a very troubled country in terms of uh, politics so that would have been problematic if we had tried to paddle in Myanmar but um, I, I just decided this window of time will work for us and um it did i mean it we could have gone longer but it worked out nicely given our schedules and what we were doing in the rest of our lives thank you uh we have a comment from one listener he says i am a veteran of the american war in vietnam who was stationed on the B mekong at the border with cambodia 
Mm -hmm. It was like the movie Apocalypse Now. Yep, yep. He said it's great to see the Mekong now and it's people living in peace and friendship with foreign visitors. So yeah. so yeah. thank you for that. Oh, and thank, thank you for saying that. You know, it's interesting. Um, Apocalypse Now and Platoon... I mean, there have some, been some amazing movies created. And um, I don't know if you noticed, but part of what I enjoy in, in creating a film or a video is when some of those scenes were uh, from, from the war were being shown, I was able to pick some music. The music, which is iconic for Platoon, is Samuel Barber's Adagio in G. It's a beautiful, beautiful piece. And it's been used for lots of things over the years, but I, it would have cost too much <laughs> to purchase that uh, because it's still, it's not in the public domain. But my friend, Mary, who had produced the video with me, we were able to go through a number of music sources and we found some music that sounded, I think very much like Adagio. And so when I watched that and I didn't fight and I wasn't there then, it, it, it almost brings me to tears because I, I think all of, all the folks who did fight and and those who lost loved ones i have i have the greatest respect for them and, and it's tragic um you know it's tragic what happened for for all parties but what impressed me the most on this journey were how friendly how resilient and how kind the vietnamese cambodian and, and La laotian people were they were very gracious thank you dave all yep. right. I have another question. Um, it's about the dam um, that they're building on the upper Mekong. Yeah. Uh, someone asks, is there is a concern that the dam building on the upper Mekong will radically change the ecology downstream for the worse? Uh, did this subject come up? Oh, of course. Brian Ehlers in his book, The Demise of the Mighty Mekong, spends a good bit of time talking about the dams, which are for the most part, all being built or proposed by the Chinese. And so one of the, the subtexts that I allude to more in the book, not so much, in fact, not at all in the film, but I talk about neocolonialism and how the Chinese, like Americans, have done all over the world. It's not like they're, they're doing something we haven't done. In fact, I'd rather see the U.S. helping in other countries building roads and you know, doing those kinds of things. But nonetheless, most of the dams are either have been built or are being built or have been proposed. The interesting thing now in Cambodia, which is a, an autocratic country, that it, it is the country that I think would be the most seriously affected by a major dam. And um, Sun, uh, the, the leader of, of Cambodia, uh, who was a Khmer Rouge soldier who flipped sides and then came back in with the Vietnamese to kick out the Khmer Rouge. Hun Sen is his name. He's been in power for 35 years, right? He has basically said no more dams, at least for now, because a lot of the people realized what would happen very in a nutshell, environmentally. Um, it Dams, we know in Washington what dams can do in terms of fish and wildlife and all that kind of stuff. But but the thing, the two things that would be dramatic is it, it keeps the silt from flowing down and replenishing the soil all the way along the river. It it the food that's grown along the river grows like the Mississippi Delta in wonderful soil that began up in Minnesota and Iowa and you know, it ends up down there, right? And so a dam stops all that silt, right? Or reduces it. The other thing is that when you get to um, Nam Pen, um, there is a, a river that flows by Nam Pen and then it goes right into the Mekong. That river um, changes directions during the monsoon. We were there during the drought, the dry season. But when the monsoon starts, which has now started, the river will go up 40, 50 feet higher, right? And it's such force coming down to uh, Nam Pen, the Tonali Sap River changes directions and flows into this huge lake. The book talks about this in more detail, which uh, is the 
gigantic lake. It's the largest lake in Southeast Asia. And the fish uh, and produce that comes out of that lake, I think it's fair to say feeds 75% of Southeast Asia. I mean, it's just this gigantic lake and it goes down 50 feet. When we were there, you, you see in the books, you see in some of my pictures, the houses on stilts, right? But then when the monsoon comes, the water rises 50 feet. And during that season, the fishing is incredible. And so the dams potentially could cut the flow and and hurt the lake. And so Hun Sen, for even though he's a dictator, realizes um, he, he doesn't want to get the people mad at him. So I think he's for now said no to the um, to the Chinese for the latest dam. All right, thanks. I had a uh, request in the uh, chat to put uh, your the title of your book in the chat, and I'm going to try to, sh I'm going to take another stab at sharing the screen and putting the book on. I think it's going to work this time. There we go. Ah, there so, it is. <laughs> um, Paddle Pilgrim, a Mekong River adventure through Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. So available at from Dave's website, from Amazon. And uh, as soon as we're done here, I'm going to put in a request that Snowell adds this to our collection if we don't already have it, so. Yeah, and that goes along with four other Paddle Pilgrim books. There's one on the Mississippi River. There's one actually on the Mississippi Headwaters, uh, which is a, a very much an environmental book. It's actually called Paddling Through Climate Change because I repaddled the headwaters in a drought season and the river was going down, 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 down. And the river was so low that barges, commerce, business couldn't go up and down. I'm sure you've read some of that. There's the Norway uh, book and there's the um, uh, Erie Canal book. So those are, are and then there, I wrote a, a children's book. I've written a book of poetry recently. And there's a couple of other more theologically oriented books. So all those are listed on my website and they're available on Amazon and on the website. Super. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. So we've got some more questions. Okay. Uh, Dave, what was your biggest challenge on this adventure? I would just say the heat. I mean, it was, it was close. I mean, you know, when it says, it's 98 degrees, but feels like 110. Mm. That's kind of the way it was the whole time. It was hot. And not only was it hot, it was humid. And not only hot and humid, but the rice farmers in the dry season uh, burn, off of the, burn off the rice paddies. And so there was smoke in the air. So imagine Seattle, you know, during one of our summers when the fires in Canada or Eastern Washington are blowing this way, right? And it and it's 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 not safe. So we were we were paddling through smoky, hot, and humid conditions, and um, that was hard, very hard. And Dave Gerke talks about that. He said it wore him out. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, someone asks, "Did you fish while you were on the river?" We did not. We we needed to make miles, but the fishing, I am told, is remarkable. Um, <laughs> um, if you've read about the Mekong, and Brian Ehlers talks about this in his book, um, there are catfish in the Mekong River that weigh over 400 pounds. Oh, my goodness. And there are freshwater rays. And I saw a picture on the internet of a 600 pound ray that there were about 15 people standing around. It got caught in the net and it took 15 people to get all the way around the outside of this ray and they were getting it disentangled and then they were letting it go. What we, what we hope for and we're disappointed not to see is there's an endangered dolphin called the Irrawaddy dolphin. And there's only a few hundred of them uh, left. And they are situated um, it, largely uh, right above the, the falls and right below the falls. And we, we didn't encounter any, but if people are interested in wildlife, um, the Irrawaddy dolphin is a remarkable animal. 
Well, Dave, just myself, I love the shot with the uh, water buffalo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you could have had a whole talk just about, um, the, do you think you could make a whole talk just about the wildlife you saw? On this well, trip? it was interesting. It, uh, those were obviously not wildlife. They were domesticated water buffalo. We saw, we saw a lot of animals, but they were largely domesticated. Um, we saw some in the uh, land of uh, 4,000 islands down by the falls. We saw quite a few birds. Um, and of course, there's lots of fish. You know, you see fish jumping and, and, and there. But it, but it was different. I didn't like on the Mississippi. I saw eagles all the time, and I was kind of hoping to see more big, big birds flying along. And um, we didn't want to see any snakes. My friends were worried about snakes. <clears throat> and uh, in the book, I actually talk about a visit we did to um, a snake farm. And the snake farm is actually the army's uh, headquarters for extracting venom from the many venomous snakes uh, in, in Vietnam in particular, so that they have enough doses so that when somebody is struck, largely people living in the countryside, right, in more rural areas, um, they, can, they can give them their, their dose of medicine. So we didn't, we saw a few snakes swimming in the river, but nothing, nothing dangerous. So. There wasn't as much wildlife as I had hoped, but um, th there were a lot of wonderful people and um, th they made up for it. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, somebody asked, what month was he there? It, you were there the month of March. Um, how did you choose March? Was it just when you were all available to go then or? No, I did research on the dry season, right? We, ha we knew we couldn't paddle in the monsoon because the river is so turbulent and high. Uh, the downside of the dry season is it's dry for a reason. It's hot. And there's no getting around that. And this year was even hotter than normal. I mean, it's like, look at the weather we are experiencing here right now, right? We're setting records. You look at the weather in Phoenix. You look at much of our country. You look at eastern Washington the last few days. Um, I mean, one of one of the areas I taught for many years was environmental studies. And um, I, I suspect there might be a few folks out there who are I mean, not believers in, in uh, climate change. And, and, and it's a complex issue. You know, it's like what's going on in Maui right now. Well, multiple causation, right, from the hurricane to politics of power companies to stream heat and wind, so all that stuff. So I don't blame everything on climate change, but what we experienced, and this is why it was so important to be with Dr. Huang and his Mekong Environmental Forum, they are trying to um, deal with uh, climate change and how that's affecting people um, along the Mekong River and in particularly the Mekong Delta which produces most of the rice in Southeast Asia, right? And so, so they, there's an economic motive. Not, it's not just a, a, this is not, sometimes we say it's just politics. Well, politics is important if it affects people's lives. And in, in Vietnam, that's a major issue. And fortunately, he's a scientist who provides good data with his citizen scientists, his students doing research, and he's gotten the ear of the government. And um, they are, in some ways, they're ahead of some of the things that we're doing. <laughs> yeah, that is terrific. But I'm glad uh, he's coming to this country and he'll be speaking here. Great. Uh, there was somebody wondering about um, whether this is being recorded. It is being recorded as we speak. It'll show up on our YouTube channel. It takes a couple weeks, one to two weeks for the editing to be done. So look for it in about seven to 10 days. If you just want to watch Dave's wonderful videos and um, just go right to his website, paddle-pilgrim.com and you can watch, you can review um, this Mekong River trip as well as his 
you know, uh, Mississippi River trip, the Norwegian Fjord trip, uh, the Hudson River trip, all of his wonderful adventures. So uh, don't forget about visiting his website. And, you know, we're just about to the time where we're going to wrap up for the evening. You can put your last questions in the chat box, but um, we're just about ready to say good night here. So, I, Dave, I just want to thank you for this spectacular presentation. I, uh, I don't know if you were the photographer, but it was just, uh, or the videographer, but it was just gorgeous. And this story has left us with so much to think about and to appreciate. And so I just really appreciate you taking the time, uh, feeling so many questions, lots of great um, comments coming through in the chat. So really what? appreciate that. Two things real quick. One, on my website is also a podcast. <clears throat> I don't know if we've got some podcasters, but I during the pandemic, I really got into podcasting. So <clears throat> there's all sorts of fun podcasts. The Paddle Pilgrim podcast. How can you forget that, right? And then, and then, secondly, if anybody uh, heard this presentation, and you work at a church, or you work at a camp, or you work at, you're a member of a Rotary Club. I mean, I do a lot of speaking. I'm glad to come out and do presentations in the community. But just reach out to me um, at Paddle Pilgrim at gmail.com and I'll be glad to talk with you about that possibility. Great, and if you forget his email, just go to, to that website. You can find everything there. You've got lots of social media going on and um, lots of great ways to connect with Dave. So, all right, well, it's time to wrap up. Uh, this event's been recorded. If you wanna watch this event or other past events, you can stop by Snow Owl Library's website, click on events, then click on event recordings. All right, thank you everyone in our audience for joining us this evening and for submitting your questions. I hope you enjoyed this program and I wish you all a very good evening. Take care. Thank you, Ruth. Good night.